Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is January the 10th, Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Tony Bariant, and I am uh, the president of the uh, Mission Viejo chapter uh, of the Hearing Loss Association of America. So welcome aboard. So just a couple pieces of information before we get started. Uh, as you can see, this meeting is being recorded. Use the chat function to send a message to another participant or to Alan Katsura if you have, oh, gee whiz, if you have um, any questions uh, regarding uh, technical support on, on this site. Uh, this is a disclaimer. Uh, the Hearing Loss Association of America Mission Viejo chapter does not endorse any single product or service. This meeting is intended to provide information, education, and support. We do have a sponsor. And again, uh, we want to thank the sponsor and let you know that Caption Call is our sponsor and uh, they provide. Um, for the uh, card provider, the captioner. So thank you, Joe, for being here. And uh, we thank Caption Call. Now, Caption Call is a landline phone that provides captions for all of your calls. You can use it on an iPhone, and I use it on an Android, and also on an iPad. So, uh, and you can use it on all three. Um, and. and and they have the service on all three if you have all of those. And so we, yeah. So captioning uh, where you need it and when you need it, uh, because life is calling. And you can call them at 877 557 2227. If you're already a user with any questions, technical support, uh, or if you'd like to find out more about the service, they'll provide that. We are a 501c3 tax exempt chapter, and any donations uh, may be available depending on your uh, deductions may be available depending on your tax status. So, and we appreciate uh, your donations. Uh, this chapter is all volunteer. Nobody receives any compensation of any kind. We depend on your don donations for support. And uh, if you go online to our website, um, www.hlaamv.org, you'll find our donate button. Okay, thank you for that. And so there is my name written out. Uh, there's my email address, Tony at HLAAMV.org. And my phone number, uh, please text me. Um, you can call me. I got my phones turned off right now. <laughs> so we're here to help. Uh, I'm here to help in any way uh, possible. So thank you very much for that. And we're gonna get right on with our program. And I wanna introduce you to Ann Thomas. And Ann, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing. I'll do that. Oops, excuse me. So I've known uh, Ann Thomas for quite some time. I consider her uh, a friend and I am so happy to have her here because she's a very talented, um, uh, provider, uh, a person. She's an award-winning hearing loss advocate. Uh, she is the Hearing Loss Association of America brand ambassador, working with chapters to make sure that we all are using the right logos and colors, et cetera. Uh, she serves um, with a lot of time on the Hearing Loss Association Get in the Loop Committee, 
which is producing educational materials so people can understand about uh, and advocate for themselves about hearing loops. And she's the president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, Diablo Valley chapter. So that's up in Northern California. Um, she discovered she was losing her hearing in 1997 and currently has two cochlear implants. She became a member of HLAA in 2008 and before joining HLAA, she had a nonprofit training, she had nonprofit training and experience. And she wants HLAA to become a household word and has been directing her efforts to that since becoming an HLAA Diablo Valley board member in 2009. And I also want to say that everything that Anne does is strictly volunteer. And she really devotes many hours for us. So, but without any further ado, uh, Anne, please. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here today with all of you to talk about a topic that is dear to my heart and it's advocacy for myself and all of you so that we can live our best lives. As you all know now by Tony's bio and introduction, I've had hearing loss for about 25 years. And so I've gone through the gamut of going from having a mild to moderate hearing loss to having a progressive hearing loss. And today I feel very fortunate to have two successful cochlear implants. If there's one thing that I've learned during this time, it's that we all live uncertain lives. Everybody with hearing loss is always in a precarious position. And that's because we don't know when we're gonna be able to understand and when we won't. And this is especially important because if you don't ask for the accommodations you need as you walk up to something that you want to engage in, if you find out that you need them when you're there, it's too late to get them because you didn't set it up beforehand. So what are some of the problems that we have? What are some of our challenges? Well, the first thing that we need to know, everybody needs to know that hearing devices, whether they're hearing aids, bone conductive devices, or cochlear implants, they aren't enough in every single situation. So the speech intelli intelligibility challenges that we face, the bane of our existence, background noise, reverberation, any of you who go to churches know that that's a huge problem. So the sound from the loudspeakers bounces all around the room, making it difficult for us to understand. Distance from the sound source. Most audiologists don't tell us that there's a limited effective range of hearing aids or hearing devices. And if you're outside that range, they don't help you. So you need other assistive technology. And of course, face masks. So Tony, can you run the poll? We oh. have, I have one poll question that I'd like to ask everybody. Sure. Okay. Okay, we're gonna do this about five more seconds. Okay, do we want to show the results? Okay. Please. So I'm gonna end the poll. Share the results. So you can see we're almost evenly spread through all the questions. 
So my hope today is mm -hmm. that everyone either learns a technique, learns about a technology that they didn't know about, or gets encouraged to work with that courage muscle that it takes for all of us to be able to ask for what we need. So Tony, you can take the poll down now. I don't see it. I thought I did. Are you seeing the poll? I'm still seeing the poll. I'm not. I just turned it off. Oh, okay, so I turned it off on my side. Okay. So how many of you people uh, how many of you here today think that hearing loss is a disability? So you don't need to answer this out loud. Just <laughs> I want you to go inside yourself and think about how you feel about that. Uh -huh. So as I was preparing for this presentation, I kept being haunted by this term disability. And I thought about all the different things that it means and thought about the huge stigma that exists around hearing loss. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, none of us want to think that we are less than. And dis seems implies less than. But this is the language of the law. So if all of us want to live our best lives, somehow we have to come to term terms with this idea of disability and that we have it and to learn how to ask for what we need. Hearing loss is covered under many disability civil rights laws. We have the California Unruh Act from 1959, 1973, the Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, we have the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 again, Section 508. We have the Fair Housing Act, which was um, created in 1968 and was amended to include disabilities in 1988. So it's not just the just the um, ADA that um, would be part of this, but there are also these other laws. So it's not standalone, and the Rehabilitation Act is what includes the federal government. So the ADA will be actually 33 years old this year. And for most of us, it's what we're the most familiar with. And there are sections in the ADA and they're referred to as titles. Title I is employment. Title II is government, state and local government. Title III is public entities, and Title IV is communication acts, or excuse me, telecommunic telecommunications. So where should you be able to get communication access? Everywhere. So if you take a look at the icons on this slide, you see museums, it's a public entity. You see schools by the uh, mortar, a stadium, banks, hospitals. Now in California, we're fortunate that our Unruh Act did not exclude anybody. Any business in California is covered under the Unruh Act. And that's different than the ADA. The ADA excluded churches. So if you were in another state other than California and you were a church, you may not be covered under the ADA. The ADA also is not particularly specific in what is required for people with hearing loss. And one of the reasons for that is because we have a spectrum disorder. So one size does not fit all. And the range of our disorder is from deaf, late deafened, severe hearing loss to mild to moderate. And those of you who are present here probably have gone through some of these different stages as your hearing loss, which may at one time, like mine, have been mild to moderate 
has now progressed to I'm late deafened. And during that time, you know that you needed different assistance to help you in a wide variety of situations. There are myths about hearing loss. When you begin asking for what you need, probably one of the first things that you're gonna encounter is that you ask for an accommodation for your hear. You tell somebody you're hard of hearing, you ask for an accommodation for your hearing loss. And the first thing somebody is gonna do is they're gonna offer you American Sign Language. There's this huge myth in the disability access community that the majority of people who have hearing loss know mm -hmm. ASL. And as you can see from this graph, <laughs> that's absolutely incorrect. So the number of people who know and use AZ ASL as their primary means of communication is estimated to be as low as 1.5%. Well, that means 98% of the rest of us can't use that technology. So this would be the first myth that you may have to overcome. The second myth is people assume that hearing aids are like glasses. I mean, you might even say, hear people say sometimes, well, why don't you get hearing aids? Well, hearing aids help us. They help us tremendously in one-to-one -one situations. But they don't replace to our hearing to normal or what is without um, any kind of decrease in the decibels. I don't like to say normal, but I slipped. <laughs> so... The next thing that you have to explain to people then is what are some of those obstacles? Because you know they're operating under these assumptions that really don't apply. So the obstacles are the distance from the sound source. And an example of this would be if you went to a lecture and you're sitting in the room, the loudspeaker is further away from you. And the rule of thumb is six to eight feet for hearing aids. And the loudspeaker more than likely is further away from that. So you're too far away. Or if you're in your own home and one person's in the kitchen and you have a family room and the other family members talking to you from the family room, that's further away than the distance from the sound source. Reverberation or echo. So that's really common in church and large situations with tall ceilings. Competing background noise, we all complain about that. So it doesn't make any difference what the advertising says for what hearing aids can do today. To the best of my knowledge, there has been no hearing device that has been completely successful in eliminating background noise. Although on a day-to-day -day basis, they're all getting better and hopefully artificial intelligence is really gonna improve that for us. But at this point in time, it still is a major issue and face masks. The, since I mentioned that the ADA and other laws don't specifically say what it is that they need to provide for us with one exception, which is large spaces, what it says is that they're required to provide auxiliary aids and services. Well, so you're wondering what are auxiliary aids and services, right? And what does the ADA actually guarantee to us? And so the ADA mandates that communication with people with hearing loss is to be equally as effective as communication without, with people without disabilities. So that gives you a really clear picture of all of the different situations that we have difficulties with that potentially we need to ask for assistance. So what are the keys to what would be considered effective communication? And you need to consider the nature, the length, the complexity, the context, or the person's normal method of communication. So the nature. I used to call this low hanging fruit, but it depends on what you're actually gonna talk about if you're just asking a question like, where's the restroom? It's not very complicated. It could be a very short uh, response. A person could use a whiteboard. They could use paper and pen, or they could 
could potentially even use infographics. Now, this infographic to the left here was developed by them uh, in Massachusetts by the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing at the beginning of the pandemic. And there are also some states that have something similar to this for people who self-identify as having hearing loss and they get it with the DMV so that if you got stopped by the police that you could hand them that card and they would know that you had hearing loss and be able to communicate with you. I would like to see us have that in California. I hope that some of you will at some point in time be open to helping work on a project like that. So you can see here how easy it would be if when people had face masks, how do you feel? And you're looking at that, the person could point to how do you feel? And you can read those and you could point back to how do you feel? So in a simple, in a simple kind of situation, this would work very well. What are other auxiliary aids and services that you might ask for? Could be a personal amplifier, the most common of which, and my personal favorite, is a pocket talker. It's made by William Sound. The pocket talker 2.0 even has a telecoil in it. You could be you could ask for an assistive listening system. So if it was a large venue like an auditorium, a lecture, an HLAA chapter meeting. We could use an assistive listening system. And I'll talk about those later on in the presentation. CART, thank you very much, Joe, for providing the captions today. We need them desperately in a million different situations. On here, I've just listed CART, but I'd like to also uh, mention that I feel very grateful for the fact that we today have automatic speech recognition captions as well. There are not enough CART reporters in the United States to fulfill all of the places that we actually need um, captions. And so in situations that don't need to be absolutely 100% accurate, I'm very happy to use them. Another auxiliary aid in service is interpreting. It could be American Sign Language, ASL, or oral interpreting in a hospital situation. And oral interpreting is when a person is specifically trained to be able to enunciate clearly. And so what they do is they repeat what's being said so that you can easily lip read them and understand what's being said. This is an example of my favorite personal amplifier. Um, you can see it says pocket talker on it. This particular image has three ways that you could connect to it. If you didn't have any kind of hearing device, you could use earbuds. If you had hearing aids that didn't have a telecoil, you could use the headphones. If you had hearing aids with a telecoil, you could use the neck loop. So to the left on this image, you see something, a black piece plugged in on the side there. Well, that's an audio port. So you would plug any of these um, connectors into that port to have the sound come to you. Now, the, one, of the, one of the other reasons that I like the pocket talker is that the microphone that you see on the top there is removable. And so you can put an extension cord in there and the extension cord can be as long as six feet and plug the microphone into the extension cord. I personally believe that every single person needs a pocket talker in their emergency to go kit. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance that you might quickly, we live in fire and earthquake and now flood country, right? It's pouring so hard at my house. Um, prior to this presentation, I'm texting Tony because I thought, oh my gosh, what happens if the electricity goes off because of our rain? And then Tony had the same kind of concern. So we all need to have to go kits for emergency situations. Assistive listening systems. So these are required for large areas. And the ADA does specify and have rules and regulations about them. And every place that in the United States that uses a public address system 
is required to have an assistive listening system for people who have hearing loss to be able to hear better. The only exception to this is the courts. The courts are, re are required to have an assistive listening system, even if they don't have a PA. So what are the three? There are currently three types. The first one is my favorite, and that's why I serve on the HLAA Get in the Hearing Loop Committee. It's called a hearing loop, and it's invisible to you in the building, but if you see the sign that's on the left with the T, you know that a hearing loop is installed in that location. If you have a telecoil, you just put your device in the telecoil mode and your hearing aid processor, bone conduct, automatically pairs with the hearing loop and it sounds like the voice is in the middle of your head. Like what you remembered when somebody talked loud in your ear. My cochlear implants have been very successful and generally I don't need anything today. And I got both of them during the pandemic. But I've been to two memorial services in the last year. And the first one was from my brother-in-law and it was a really sad um, situation. And they live in North Carolina and my husband and I went back East for his service. And the, everybody was so upset about the fact that he'd passed away. I didn't want to deal with having to ask for communication access. And I'm sure all of you can relate to being in that same situation at some time. And I walked it up to this church and it was this huge old church um, with carvings behind the altar and everything. And lo and behold, they had a hearing loop sign. I was like, really over the moon because I hadn't asked and I didn't know what I'd be able to understand. And it turned out this was the first time that I had been in a large situation. And as soon as the, the minister started talking, I realized I was in deep trouble because there was all of this reverberation in the church. Mm -hmm. I was able to put my uh, cochlear implants in telecoil and I heard clear as a bell every single thing that was said. I felt very grateful. I had the same situation in another um, memorial service. So see, it's rebuilding on this thing that we never know when we're going to hear and when we can't, you know, to, so to think about being prepared. The other two assistive listening systems here, an FM, which is like FM radio, and infrared. I don't like either one of them as well as a hearing loop. Um, and the reasons are every single person needs a receiver. So that means you have you can't just walk into a place and take care of yourself and be there like everybody else. You have to figure out where they're distributing the receivers. Then you have to make sure that if you have a telecoil that you get a neck loop. And I have had a situation where no matter how many times I asked ahead of time um, to make sure when they had an FM that they made sure that they put in clean batteries in the receiver. And lo and behold, I'm at a play, I'm in the middle of the exact punchline which you were waiting to hear or a presentation and the most important piece in the batteries died. And you know, nobody likes to get up and disturb everybody to go take care of that. And not only that, but then you missed what was actually said. So I'm just providing this to you as information based on my experience and why I prefer hearing loops. Um, if a place had either an FM or an infrared and it worked for you, they provided communication access and that's fine. If by something happens and you try either one of those and it really doesn't work for you, then you, you have something to go forward to that then say, hey, listen, hearing loops work most of the time. We want that. So it's something to advocate for. In 2010, the ADA standards were really updated. And at that time, they was the first time they mandated that assistive listening systems have to be hearing aid compatible. And the way that happens is with a neck loop. Captions, we love them, right? 
No. The captions, the acronym CART is Communication Access Real-Time Translation, and CART is the gold standard. You can have in-person captions, you can have remote captions. I already mentioned you could also, have, though I have it later on this thing, you can have closed captions, you can have open captions. And closed and open, the difference is one you can turn on and off and the other one's embedded. So the picture here to the right, the first one on the large screen, that's CART at an, AS, at an HLA convention. The image to the left there are automatic speech recognition captions. And more than likely, I took that picture because I use Ava and I know that's what Ava looks like on your telephone. So there are, there are a wide variety of ASR captioning apps to use on your smartphone, on your tablet and on your desktop now. And Ava is my favorite, it works on both um, Apple, iPhone, and also Androids. And if you happen to have an Android telephone, you have live Google Live Transcribe that you can use. Now, one of the major differences between all of the other ASR apps and Ava is all of them only allow you to transcribe a single running conversation. Ava, on the other hand, can have multiple people in the conversation identified by their own icon and this allows you to be able to use that app and maintain social distancing because you can be more than six feet away because you're talking into your own um, phone or device that would be captioning and then the other person could see it and of course translation we have american sign language we have tactile interpreting the first time i attended an event where the full hearing loss community was there and somebody did tactile interpreting. I almost cried. The person was deaf blind. And the only way that they could understand was a, a, there was a special person there that was signing in the palm of their hand. And this person could understand them. And oral interpreting, which I mentioned previously. This image here on the left, I took at the Walk for Hearing in San Francisco in 2010. And I really thought it captured the beauty of the ability to communicate with ASL. So I've told you about what some of the technology is. Now you're sitting there going like everyone else going, well, great. So now I know what these things are, but how do I get them? And this was a conversation that we've had for many years in the Diablo Valley chapter. So the first thing to do is to look for an ADA coordinator. All city government is required to have an ADA coordinator. So if you wanted to participate in the programs and services of city government, the person to look for is the ADA coordinator. If you're in a hospital or healthcare, one of the places to go to is patient services. Or this is very strange to me, and I don't really understand why it's like that. But a lot of the accommodations other than ASL are also included in interpretive services in the healthcare field. I'd also like to mention here that every time you visit your physician or participate in your healthcare system. And afterwards, they send you an email asking about how was the service? You know, how, what did you experience? Please don't ever fill one of those out without saying it was terrible because you didn't get the accommodations that you needed to be able to understand if you didn't get them. So it's my understanding that the company that's doing this surveying for them is not the hospital itself. They're contracted out and they get a score based on what those reviews are. And so the hospital wants the highest score possible. So when they get lower scores than what they had anticipated, they don't like it. So it's a direct way that you be, you're able to influence them. Another place to look is visitor information. Oh, I see I have a typo on my slide there. I'm missing an R on information. So 
if you go to a web pay, website for a theater that you're interested in going to, many times they list accessibility under visitor information. Even some hospitals do that as well. So that's another option for you. Trying to find who to contact to get what you need sometimes can be difficult. Everybody needs to remember, and maybe it's what's going to really, really, really help you exercise the courage muscle, because that's what you have to have to ask for what you, what you need, is that communication access helps people with hearing loss the same way, help, the same way ramps help people with mobility issues. And it seems like a lot of people have a hard time understanding that people within the hearing loss community as well as people who were asking for accommodations for and sherry parazzoli hla washington invented this um hearing access symbol equals the mobility symbol and i think she might be here today and so sherry thanks very much for doing that it's been a very powerful tool for all of us i'd like there to be hearing friendly communities all across America, from San Francisco to New York. And what's it gonna take for that to happen? Well, we all have to have awareness about what's available to us, what kind of tools are there to be able to assist us so that we can live our best lives. We have to have the courage to ask, and we have to take the action to ask for it. And that's how we're gonna get change. And if we don't do this, people keep saying, well, nobody asks, nobody does this, nobody does that. We can't do that anymore. As you have you seen, the, the ADA is gonna be 33 years old this year. I don't want it to be 40 years old with out better accommodations than what we currently have. Takes courage. And you're not a bad person to ask for what you need. We're gonna open this up to having questions and answers. And there's, I'd like to have a, uh, a moment here to uh, recall for everybody how to do that. So if you look at the menu bar across the bottom of your screen and you see the smiley face, that's reactions. And if you click on that, um, you can raise your hand and see where it says raise your hand. You click on that. And when you're done, you click off. Before I go and open it up to um, questions and answers, I wanted to let everybody know that I've been working on advocacy for a really long time. And the members of the Diablo Valley chapter kept saying, well, how do we find the ADA coordinator? How do we do this? How do we do that? So we got some grant funding from a, from a local service organization. And originally our hope, Alan Kutsura and mine, was that we could create an app for the ADA coordinators. And it turned out that that was just actually too complicated. So, Alan found a plugin for our website. And originally the idea was we were gonna do all list all of the ADA coordinators for city government for all of the cities in our county. So that meant that any person who was a member of our chapter or anybody who lived in our county would know who to contact to partake of a program or service of any city government. And after we created that, then we expanded it to the county next door, and now it exists actually for all of California. So for any of you who's looking for the ADA coordinator in your area, you can go to our website and find that. And I'm gonna go ahead and flip this um, PowerPoint off, and I'd like to show you where that is on our website. And we also have a list of the locations that have hearing loops in California. So hang on a second here, let me.
Okay, so this is our website. And you can see here, hearing access, we have ADA coordinators and hearing loop venues. Sometimes Zoom doesn't like to let you move. There we go. Okay, so they're listed by county. We have a search window here. You could list the city. We have all of the cities and it's in alphabetical order. I'll pick this first one just because it's here. And so we can see that the name to contact at Alameda, Alameda City Hall in Alameda is Laura Weisinger. If you click on her name, Oh, if you click on send email, opens up an email that you can directly send her a message. Here's her phone number. Here's the address. And if there happened to be any ADA information on their website, we included it. So this is here for everybody. Um, so I'm very grateful Alan was able to find this very easy to uh, manipulate and use tool that's really straightforward. And this and our hearing loop venues list are both living documents. Now, there's no way that we could maintain all of this without everybody's assistance because things change all the time. So somebody leaves, we get more hearing loops. There's a hearing loop that we didn't know about. So we're relying on everybody to provide us with additional information so we can try and keep this as up to date as possible. So please feel free to contact us. I also would like to point out here on our website that we have a brochure for Ask for Communication Access. It has the symbol here with the hearing access symbol with mobility. You have suggested um, technologies that might be things that you want to use. You can use this maybe to develop your, your um, courage muscle. We also have additional information if you're looking to, let me go back here. If you're looking to, um, for information about advocacy to bolster your knowledge and education. We have in information about hearing loss as a civil rights issue, ADA accommodation options for public venues, a checklist for providing effective communication. This checklist was developed because I was advocating to attend uh, town hall meetings with my legislators and they weren't providing communication access. And I went to talk to them and they were open to doing that. But then after the third time, they weren't really providing what, what we all needed. And I went back and talked to them and the person told me, he really didn't know what to ask for when he's interviewing venues. So that's that resulted in this checklist. Let's see if it'll come up easily. So if you were going to an event in your city in um, your legislators or something like that, and um, they didn't know what to ask for either, this is there for them. So here's a checklist. Who, who might be at this event? Depends on who's there as to what you need types of assistive listening systems. This might be just helpful for you as well. So Tony, now we're gonna go back to full full open for questions. Okay, um, Maureen, you yes. have a question. I don't have my video on, but my major thing, and I don't know how to deal with it, is when I go to the theater, oh. I imagine 99% of the theaters are not looped because it isn't possible. You're shaking your head. Am I right or wrong? No, that's not correct. It's possible to loop both movie theaters and live performance theater. Okay, so assuming that the theater is one that is small like Laguna Playhouse, and it's not looped, what is the best thing for me to use? Okay. My problem is understanding, not actually the sound, but the differentiation of words. Yeah, so clarity. So whether they have 50 people or not, they're using 
amplification for the sound for the audience, correct? Yes. Then they're required to provide an assistive listening system. Now, if you really love this, this theater and everything, it would be a wonderful project to have to raise money from community service organizations and with them to have a system installed. Tony. Yes, the Laguna Playhouse does have assistive listening devices. They have an FM system. All right, can you explain what that means? I mean, I'm wearing my hearing aids and I'm assuming turning the T coil on is not going to help in that situation. Oh, yes, yes, it can. What you're going to do is you're going to request a receiver and you're going to ask for a neck loop. The neck loop will provide access to the sound. So, so Anne, right now, she is putting on, uh, uh, she's got a receiver there. And uh, I'm going to get an audio cable. Hang on. Okay. So she has. Okay. So this is the kind of receiver I was talking about. Looks kind of like, it may be a little different looking than this. Um, is the receiver for the signal. And remember there were headphones, earbuds, and a neck loop. All of these receivers have an audio port to connect to how you're going to get the information. So obviously, if it was a headphone, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that question. A headphone, you just plug the audio port in here. If it were earbuds, you would just plug the earbuds in there and put it in your ear. If you have a telecoil, you need a neck loop there to provide you with a neck loop. This one happens to be amplified and has another piece at the bottom. You can get these free from the California Telephone Access Program. We're entitled to one accessory of each type from them, and one of the accessories is a neck loop. And this is from our California Telephone Access Program. And it's my favorite one of all time. Comes with different connectors for different things. You plug the connector into the bottom. You plug the cable into the top. You put it on. You put your device in telecoil. And this one, since it can be amplified, you turn it on. And this usually gets green, but obviously my battery is dead. And this automatically connects to your hearing aid and you would be able to get the FM in that situation. And that's what they're required to provide. Now, I have another question to ask you or to have you think about. Today, we have many accessories that come with our hearing instruments. Some of these are portable microphones. Some of them are other things like that. If they have the capability of connecting to your hearing aids, like sometimes the, you know, the mics connect wirelessly to your hearing aid, and they have an audio port on the bottom that you can connect that to your computer. You can also connect that to any transmitter. So you'd have your mic portable microphone. You'd put it in here. You'd put this in the bottom of the microphone and it automatically would connect to your hearing instrument. Does that answer your question? It does. And I may check in with Tony because she's familiar with the Laguna Playhouse and, and not take up everybody else's time. Thank you very, very much. Um, listen, your question isn't taking up everybody's time because other people have the same question. It's just a different theater. Right. Okay. Thank so you. what I just talked about, everybody needs to know that. All right. Um, Maureen, you had your hand up. 
but looks like you took it down. Maybe I took it down. Did you? Did yeah, you? no, I took it down because you answered it. Oh, okay, good. Well, uh, many of you are here in Laguna Woods. And um, so we have like 13 hearing loops in Laguna Woods. I've advocated for them. And the one that's the most exciting is, the, is that our theater, which is 826 seats, Clubhouse 3, also known as the Performing Arts Theater here in Laguna Woods, has been looped. In that, in that clubhouse, there's also Dining Room 1 and Dining Room 2, and those are looped. Uh, the PC Club uh, Education Room it, not the workshop, but the education room is looped. Um, the administration building where they hold the board meetings, that's looped. Um, a clubhouse too, the main ballroom, and they have two or three meeting rooms, smaller meeting rooms, and those are all looped. Uh, clubhouse five, has the FM system like Ann just showed. Uh, Clubhouse six has FM system. So you have to ask for a device. And I may have left something off here. We have a lot of accessibility. Um, we don't have everything, so we can work on it. What do you want, uh, Don Ann? Um, my church has recently installed the loop. However, we have not done any advertising as I think we should have a sign out front. Uh, it's not on our website. And I've talked to my pastor, but you know, he's, a, a, he's not hard of hearing. I don't think he understands that if I'm new to a community and I'm driving down the street, and I drive by my church and I see the sign or I go on the website, I'm looking for something. Um, so I'm kind of frustrated. Do I just keep bugging them? <laughs> Don Ann, which, which church is it? Uh, Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church on Muirlands, Muirlands of La Paz. So as part of... Where is that located? Is that on Moulton? Muirlands and La Paz. So as part of the Get in the Hearing Loop oh, Committee, okay. we have released an advocacy guide for everybody to use. And one of the um, sections is on success stories. And there are some pieces for churches. So um, we have some, some signs of churches. We have sample um, cards that could be put in the bulletin informing everybody that they um, have a hearing loop. And if you contact me, I would customize our sample card specifically for your location. So all oh. they'd have to do is print them and cut them and stick them in. Oh, well, that might be a start, but they really should have a sign out um, front, should they? Should you're required to, to have a sign. Okay. So the installer would have given them the sign? No, the require the installer's not required to provide signage. The venue is required to provide signage. So oh. sometimes installers provide a little sign but the ada and california pretty much has, has accepted that uh says that the symbol needs to be six inches tall so, so i need really... to, i need to ad advise my pastor that the signage for out in front of my church is going to have to be done by the church uh, okay that makes sense i will do that and thank you i can make one for you to show him Mine must have fallen off. I usually have one sitting right up there and I can just hold it up and show you what that looks like, but I don't, it obviously isn't there at the moment. So I'd be happy to do that for you. Just email me. My email is, thank you very much. There's one right there. Ann Mundell has one. So it's A. Thomas, because my name's Ann Thomas at hearinglossdv.org. 
And all of these things are available on the HLAA website. And I'd like to go ahead, since I was able to pull that up before, show you where that is. There are lots of things I do well, but I don't type well. <laughs> okay, so let me share this. Oops. Okay. Okay, so this is the landing homepage for HLAA. You go to programs and events and see over there in the left-hand corner, it says get in the hearing loop and then get in the hearing loop resources. Both of those two places have information and the information is different. When you click on the hearing loop resources, we have originally what we started out with was a toolkit checklist for getting the hearing loop. This has been a whole huge multi-year project, put, getting all of these things together for everybody. And they were it was just completed late last fall. And this checklist are all of the things that you might possibly ever need about hearing loops, information to substantiate um, why they need one, what they need, we also have a new piece we advocated with Google to add hearing loops as one of the accessibility features on Google Maps. And I'm very happy to say that they said yes. So now we're, we've are we been seeding them with information about all the hearing loops and hear directions on how to go about doing that and advocating for that. And we also have information now on hearing for hearing health care providers. So all of this is here for you. We have our advocacy guide. We have a toolkit handbook and it's in two parts here because it was it's so big. It's a, it's a um like a hundred pages that um, HLA couldn't load it at one time on the website, so we split it. So this advocacy guide here is steps on how to advocate for what you need. Everything you need is here. All of these pages, when you get to the table of contents, all of these are hot. So all you have to do is here's hearing loop success stories, you click on that and here are some success stories. And I'm gonna to go to the ones for churches because that's what was mentioned here a moment ago. Places of worship here. So in Holland, Michigan, they have 288 places of worship with hearing loops. So that means there's almost, almost every place of worship there you can go hear and understand. Okay, Alan, I think you're you're next. Do you want to answer your question, and then and then it'll be Gail, Gail Olson. Actually, Anne Mundell Noel had a comment or a question in the chat, and she might want to elaborate on the question. Oh. I had just asked Anne, what is the penalty if a business does not comply? to the ADA standard. Okay, there is no monetary penalty per incident for the ADA. There is monetary penalty for the California Unruh Act. And there could be penalty if you would have a civil, a disability civil suit. So if you, there are certain ways that you can object to lack of compliance you can file a complaint with the Department of Justice. If you do that, they're not required to investigate what you've said. They pick what they want to investigate. So you have no guarantees that they're going to do that. If you hire a disability attorney, there's no charge to you personally. The disability attorneys take their fees out of any settlement that would happen. And you might be thinking, well, you know, how can that be? And I, the disability attorney that I'm, the attorneys I'm friends with have told me that 
99% of cases don't go to court. Just having a disability attorney gives clout to whatever you're complaining about, and people know that you're just not going to go away. And so I gave this presentation to our chapter on Saturday, and John Waldo was there, who's a disability attorney. And he recently handled something for someone who was with the ALDA in San Jose, and he all he had to do was write three letters, and it was a done deal. And she'd written five things before that. And that when those cases are big enough to go to court, they make enough money to cover everything else. So there's no worry to you as a person. That is that what you needed to know, Anne? Yeah, thank you. Just that for the um, members here to know that they do have a voice and it matters. Okay, uh, Gail Olson, your question. Yep, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, please. Okay, hello everyone. Um, regarding the churches and the loop systems, I just recently started going to a church and a lot of hearing impaired people are at that church, but they really do talk loud. They preach loudly. I mean, they are really, <laughs> so I hear everything and I was starting to sit in front, but I had a friend from HLA join me uh, at this church and she said, well, do they have assistive listening device. And I said, you know, I never asked. So I asked the pastor right before. And she said, no, we don't. How do I, I know you went to the website. I want to know, does the church uh, have to pay for the loop? And do I need to go on the website to find out who I contact? Or do I contact the pastor? Just briefly, what are my steps? Because I do want them to have one. Yeah. So I'd suggest that you take a look at our advocacy guide. It's loaded with wonderful information, but it's my understanding, depending on the church, the pastor doesn't actually run the church. So there are, frequently there are groups of people who determine how they spend money is what they do. So I would investigate to see who is the, like, it's like the board of directors for the church to find out who that is. And then you approach them and say, oh, listen, you know, um, did you really want to violate people's civil rights and exclude us from being able to attend church services? Or you wouldn't necessarily have to hit them that hard up front, but do you understand what I'm saying? So they're not, they, they're really not thinking. So if they realize that one in five people have a hearing loss. That's the rule of thumb. They're excluding one in five people from being able to attend their services. And when you start talking to people about that, all of a sudden they go, oh, you know, it's in churches. And the church, the venue is required to provide the accommodations at no charge to the person with a disability. That's the law. How much do they pay? What is the average and is there somebody in the area that installs the loop um so the it's difficult in the conversation like this to um give you an estimate because of the fact we don't know how big the space is see oh. depending on the size of the space depending on um what the floor is made of if there's a lot of metal in the floor there's a certain way that they would they uh, might have to design the hearing loop and things like that it also depends on what kind of microphones and things they already have in place so like if a place had a bad pa I mean, places can have really bad technology and they were going to go ahead and do a hearing loop that technology that they have for the microphones could potentially affect how the hearing loop works because the microphone is what mm -hmm. you take the sound in. So see, it's it's not real easy to um, do that for a small space, could be $5,000, which is not a lot of money. Right, but who pays that? The church? The church. Okay, that's what I needed so to know. What you need to think about is, 
Our accommodations are the same as wheelchair access, mobility issues. So who pays to cut the curb for accessibility for mobility issues? And when you get that in your mind, then you, then you understand, oh, we're the same as that. Well, I'm gonna need a lot of courage because churches, for my experience, they don't like it in temples. They just don't like doing it. But I don't want to jump the gun yet because I have not asked. But if it's $5,000, it's going to take a lot of my part to get the courage up to ask the church. To um, do that's this. not but a I, lot I, of I know money. I need to. Thank you. That is not a lot of money. Uh, right, right, right. So, Gail. Thank you. Anne. Yeah. Thank you. So, for everybody, I'd like to say when you're talking to churches, you need to put a bug in their ear that people that don't understand what's going on at church don't attend. Right. And there goes donations, you know, tithing, there goes bequeaths when they pass. The relationship is broken because there's no communication, mm -hmm. because there's no good, there's no communication for the parishioners, for the attendees. So really, my question is, why wouldn't they provide it? I'm um, Gail. You know, one of the things that happens too is that a lot of people don't understand what the cost is of audio video equipment. So if you don't have any idea what a, what a just a regular microphone costs, you're thinking that the, this is a big expense. I mean, a regular a wireless microphone, not anything great, is 500 bucks. So audio video equipment is really pricey. So this type price we're talking about, a hearing loop, is not that big of a deal. I'd, I'd like to just say one more thing. Churches, hearing loops, even assistive devices, if they would start talking about it, if, if we would be able to identify, if they would identify other people that have hearing loss, they could come together and have a bake sale. They, they'll pull their money together and that's how it gets done. And that will help the church tremendously because they're always worried about funds. They could raise it themselves. And that's how it does get done in my estimation. That is what I've seen. And oftentimes one person might be the person mm -hmm. to donate for the entire cost. So, but you, ju you just have to have people who are with hearing loss talking about it in the church, asking and forming a group, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get this done? There you go. Thank you. Uh, Sarah has her hand up. Um, yes. Thank you, Anne, for all this great information. Um, I'd like to talk about a different menu, venue. I was on vacation in Monterey, and I went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And lo and behold, I went to the event where they were feeding the fish in this huge tank. And there was a person using a microphone and a whole lot of people sitting on the floor, standing against the wall. And I could not understand um, what was being said of a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. So I talked to the volunteer there. I said, you know, I can't hear this. And sh she went downstairs and connected me with a person who's very interested in helping me hear things. And um, it, I'd like to ask you, I mean, first off, in their theater, it's, loop, it's looped with a telecoil because I went in there and tried it out. That works. But and uh, the man I talked to showed me different, some devices he had, but they weren't working. So how would a person who's holding a microphone, how could they make that more accessible? I suggested captioning on the screen next to where the person was talking. Would a uh, listening device also be 
uh, possible that uh, people could come into the aquarium, check them out and use them for their time. And that would be connected to all the microphones that this, the people were using. So Sarah, I'll give you an example that we're gonna change it from fish and it might be easier for you to go use one. Lots and lots and lots of museums have walking tours and the walking tours at the museums, everybody checks out the audio <laughs> box thing. And that audio box thing can be connected to a neck loop. Okay. Okay, so that's one piece. So if they, potentially if they were pre-recorded, another thing is there are uh, specific FM systems created for walking tours. So I'm not exactly sure how they have that set up at the aquarium. I haven't been in a while. So um, we don't know what that uh, microphone, what the PA was connected to. You know, potentially, they could add an FM receiver and then everybody could just, you have people who needed it could use the FM. Okay, thanks so much. I wanna tell you they're very amenable to hearing um, suggestions. So I told them I would, uh, I would send some suggestions their way and that they even have an accessibility team there. So I was a little surprised that the, the, the devices they had were not working or were not being used. It seems like, you know, it, it didn't all make sense, but they, they want to fix things. Yeah, so Sarah, that's an example of, see, right now, they may have had dead batteries. Yeah. See, and that's the part that we've complained about, about FMs. But in a mobile situation, it's much more difficult to do hearing loops than it is to do an FM. I see. Yeah. That makes sense. Sherry Perizoli was here. Is she still here? Sherry, do you have another idea? No, doesn't seem. No, I was going to say my understanding um, oh, Sherry's about. There. Yeah. Yeah, so my understanding uh, about the museum and the situation that Sarah uh, described was um, was very typical of a of an audio um, description situation. I, I said that wrong, not audio description, but a, of an oral presentation where they're providing additional information that's not typically held in an auditorium. And oftentimes, you know, I, I hearing loop could be used in the same situation. But I agree with Anne that the walking tours are really best done with either um, an audio glide. And sometimes the audio glide might look like um, an old fashioned cell phone. Uh, they're, you, know, you hold them up like a cell phone. Um, but those two can be switched to the telequel position and you can hear uh, clearly but you might not know that, you just have to try it. But the audio glides uh, are very common in Europe um, and it, it, it looks just like an old fashioned telephone. So that's the only other thing I can think of, Anne. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Sherry. And so that you all know, Sherry Perizoli is the chair of the HLA Get in the Hearing Loop Committee and president of HLA Washington. Okay, so next we have uh, Don Ann. Um, I just wanted to say that um, when I became, um, I went to another church uh, that had the loop and I came back to my church and started talking about it. And it became really clear um, that what was needed, um, they didn't understand the extent um, of um, what a loop would do for the church, what we were missing, what you were talking about, Tony, with people not going to church. So somebody suggested, and I did a proposal, and I sent this proposal to every single committee, to the pastors, because I didn't know who really was going to have use of it. Lo and behold, our loop was put through the, our memorials committee. 
because they got enough money to do it. And the chairman of that committee said that that proposal was what helped them understand what they needed, where to get it, what it was going to do, et cetera. So they just didn't understand how much this loop would do for us. So uh, that piece of paper, it took a while, but it eventually did the trick. Congratulations. Okay. Yes, thank you, uh, Don Ann. We didn't show her because she didn't have her video turned on. Okay. Any other last minute questions? I see a question in here um, about the Oticon Connect clip. And it may very well work. So I've been talking about the Connect clip and some other things with Minna Chatterjee, who's on our, our call here today. And so I've been doing some investigative work on it in the last five days. So theoretically, you probably could plug the bottom of the Connect clip, the audio port on the Connect clip into the FM receiver. And then it would you would transmit that sound wirelessly to your hearing instrument. It's my understanding, and it's disappointing uh, to hear that some of our major hearing aid companies have not put a telecoil in their hearing aid, uh, but they provide telecoil or hearing loop accessibility by providing a microphone, the little mini clip. Um, just be aware that that's a choice, but it's not the only choice. Uh, I know that if you have to use a mini clip, there's a lot of issues with that. The batteries are dead, you forgot to bring it, you lose it, all kinds of things. It's much more convenient just to have it be part of your hearing aids and we and i i i for one will insist on that a mini clip is good for a lot of things but for telecoil uh, i want to be able to sit down in an auditorium uh, or in a meeting room turn on uh, my telecoil and and hear i don't want to have to have another accessory um, Tony, before we close, before you close the meeting, can I have a, a few minutes to talk about a telecoil and telecoil settings? Sure. Well, let's go ahead and do that now. But but I kind of lose people towards the end here. So I want to say this. Everybody who is on this meeting right now, after giving a little time to process, Zoom to process the recording, I will email you a, a temporary link so you can rewatch it. And that'll give me time to process the video for YouTube. So I will do that. Uh, it usually takes an hour or so for Zoom to process the video. And when, as soon as I can get a link, I will email all the participants in this meeting with that link. Okay. So. Would you go ahead, Anne, and let's talk yeah. about the telecoil. So I have met very few people who had telecoils in their hearing devices activated before they came to an HLAA meeting. We have no idea why audiologists generally, and Anne, I'm not talking about you. I know you're not like that but audiologists generally don't understand the value of a telecoil for us and either don't act, has it in the device and doesn't activate it or doesn't tell the people, person about how to use it. So people come to HLA meetings that have hearing loops and then we start talking about telecoils and then everyone goes back to their audiologist to have the telecoil turned on. So, in the last, I'm gonna say four years for sure, 
maybe a little longer than that. Something has changed in regard to telecoils that we didn't have in the past. So I'm gonna talk about what we had in the past. So in the past, you could have multiple telecoil programs. And I used to have a telecoil program that was telecoil and mic, and I had a telecoil only program. And I would use whichever one worked the best for me at that time. So the reason one would have a telecoil and mic program is because maybe you want to hear the person sitting next to you. And so you would need to have the microphone on your hearing instrument activated. The problem with that is that if you're in a space that has a lot of background noise and you have the T-coil and mic program, the microphone picks up all the background noise too. And so in Northern California here, the chapters all advocated with our um, Bay Area Rapid Transit to have hearing loops installed. And we have we were successful and 755 of the new cars have them and all of the BART stations have them in the information booths. And when we were doing the pilot testing for that, maybe there were 25, 30 of us at one of the stations. And half of the people said, oh my God, this is terrible. And the other half of us said, oh gosh, this is wonderful. So since I had both um, T-coil and Mike and T-coil, I could check both situations. And when I put my hearing instrument in T-coil and Mike, I mean, you know how loud train stations are? All of that got picked up along with the loop. And so it wasn't um, an advantageous situation. So I always encourage people if they have an extra slot in their hearing instrument to make sure that you had both programs. But in recent times, what's happened is we now have the ability when our remote controls for our hearing instruments move to our cell phone, all of a sudden, Many, 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 many um, hearing aids and cochlear implants can adjust the balance in their app on their phone between how much is microphone and how much is T coil. So if you have that, you could you potentially would only need one T coil program. And if you were in a situation where there was additional loud noise, you would just move the slider on your app to be more in T-coil and diminish the microphone. Mina, did you want to make a comment? I appreciate you showing the Oticon mini mic. Yes, you are probably going to hear my students in the background. They've come in for reset because it is pouring torrential rain out here. Um, so hopefully they'll be quiet enough so that you can hear me. Okay, um, I'm going to talk as loud as I can. This is the Oticon Connect clip. And hold on one second. It's classic. Genius. 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 Estoy hablando con Oticon. Pongo el silencio ahora. Cuando se digo, ponen voz en habla. Silencio. Silencio. Okay, I got my class quiet so that you can hear me. They're first graders. Um, okay, so this is the Connect clip. I am not certain what the person meant by a walking tour. But I could give this connect clip to the person presenting. They could clip it. They could clip it on their shirt. And then whatever they say would get streamed into my hearing aid, into my Otacon hearing aid. And, but, so, um, and I use it in the restaurant. If it's noisy, the people pass it around and it goes into my hearing aid. I've never done it for a walking tour, but I think in theory, in theory, the idea would be the same. Okay, that's what I, and I also, I have my telecoil switch set up the way that Ed has it, what she said, that I only get the telecoil, no background noise. So I do not hear my students, for example, when I'm on the telephone, because it goes to the telecoil switch. Okay, that's what I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Mina. 
um, I'd like to I'd like to make a comment, um, a recommendation. If you're going to buy hearing aids, please talk to your audiologist and don't let them talk you out of a, a T coil. A lot of them will try to talk you into Bluetooth, and Bluetooth works great, but it's so very limited. You cannot use Bluetooth in an auditorium or in a playhouse or any large venue. Bluetooth is pretty much great for your cell phones, tablets, computers. You, it's one-on-one -on -one communication. Does not work in a large area venue. So there are some hearing aid manufacturers that have both. So ask your audiologist, if you can have both. And of course, everybody's hearing loss. Uh, I love the way Anne said, you know, we have a hearing loss spectrum. So I don't know where you are. So different hearing aids for different spectrums. <laughs> so, but you could ask for a hearing aid that provides both Bluetooth and telecoil. So if, if you are in that fortunate position that you have not yet purchased hearing aids, uh, or you're going to purchase hearing aids, please make that note for yourself. Okay. And it's been fantastic. Uh, I just appreciate you so much on so many levels. This was a real top-notch um, presentation. Uh, I, I will be preparing it to put on the, um, our, chapters YouTube channel. And uh, so it'll be, be ready, but it'll probably take, probably take a day or two. But I will send out a link uh, in about a, within an hour to the, uh, to the video that's still on Zoom that's been processed. So that'll just be a little quickie. And you can certainly share that link with people that you think would benefit from today's program. So Tony, thank you very much for asking me to give this presentation. And for all of you here today, I hope that there was something that I said that inspired you, that you learned something, that somehow there was some tidbit that can help you live your best life with hearing loss. Because whether life goes on, right? We all have to do just the best we can do. Absolutely. Okay, how's, how's the storm up there right now? So Mina indicated it was really bad. Yeah, I, I look out my window here and I can, I can see it's been really bad, but at the moment it's a little bit calm. So everybody stay dry, happy new year. Um, and uh, our next meeting will be February, oh boy, I didn't write it down. A uh, second Tuesday of the month, so it's the 14th. Oh, we're, it's going to be on Valentine's Day. So, and I want to continue the conversation uh, regarding assistive listening devices. And I'm going to ask Ann Mundell Noel, she's our chapter uh, audiology advisor, to join us. Lots of questions can be answered, discussed, and answered about telecoils. Um, she she's ideal to talk about that. So uh, that will be the 14th of February. And let's just strike while the iron is hot and keep the conversation going. All right. So for now, thank you for coming. Bye. Stay dry.